Hi, everyone. Welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and welcome to Ask the Experts Live, Eczema 101 with Dr. Jenna Lester. Uh, this event is in collaboration with the Skin of Color Society and has been made possible with the support of our Eczema Awareness Month sponsors, Sanofi Genzyme, Regeneron, AbbVie, Water Wipes, Eli Lilly, Baby Dove, Dermavant, and CeraVe. My name is Jessica Bartolini. I am Nia's Senior Manager of Partnerships. Uh, today's event is a part of our Eczema Awareness Month where we are encouraging you to get Eczema Wise. For more information about Eczema Awareness Month and how to get involved, please visit eczemaawarenessmonth.org. Today's Q&A is focused on the basics of eczema. We will start the questions with pre-sourced, uh, we will start with questions we pre-sourced from our community on our social media channels. If you have a question that you would like to ask during this Q&A, please put it in the chat and um, we will let you know if we're gonna be able to answer it during the live session. We ask that everybody remain on mute during this time to ensure that you guys can hear both myself and Dr. Lester. Um, and a quick reminder, there will be an opportunity tomorrow to connect directly with other members of the community during our Unhide Eczema support group. And for more information about that, um, please visit eczemaawarenessmonth.org. Uh, Lauren will also include a link in the chat for that um, support group. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce you all to our expert today, Jenna Lester, MD, uh, board certified in dermatology. Dr. Lester is an assistant professor of dermatology at UCSF, where she practices and teaches general dermatology and is the founding director of the Skin of Color program. She was named a Watson Faculty Scholar, a prestigious award dedicated to the support of new faculty at UCSF. Dr. Lester is a sought after lecturer, has written book chapters and published articles in peer reviewed journals, and is currently building an economic research program in dermatology. Dr. Lester, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thanks for having me. Of course. Well, I'm just gonna fire away with our very first question. Sure. Um, the first question we have from our community is what causes eczema? So that is a, an essential question to understand and I think it helps to think about how we treat eczema as well. Um, and so eczema is thought to be have both a genetic and an environmental factor. So genetics there's you probably have some sort of underlying tendency towards eczema. Um, and that could mean other people in your family have it. So it's something that you're aware you might get, but also there are people who are the first in their families to get it. Um, and there probably is also a trigger um, in your environment. So we know that, um, you know, excessive hand washing or exposure to dust or certain allergens, um, living in cities can be a, a more of a trigger um, for eczema. So you, you're in an environment where you're exposed to things that make it more likely for you to develop eczema, and then it reveals your underlying tendency towards having it. And then, and that presents as itchy, inflamed skin. Um, it can affect people focally. So just in certain areas of the body, it can be more widespread. And we know that it really can interrupt people's lives and be very, very disruptive. Great, thank you so much. Um, what are, we, we, all, we know if we've heard there's seven different types of eczema. What are those seven different types of eczema? So I don't really think of it as the seven different types. Um, I, I really think of, um, and, and that's because the treatment of them is very similar. So in dermatology, we focus more on um, morphology or shapes when we're describing how something looks, but not because it puts someone in a different sort of bucket or group when they're being treated. Um, you know, people can have flexural eczema, which is like in the folds of the body. There's numular eczema, which looks more coin shaped. There's um, more erythrodermic eczema, which is like all over the place, all over the body, but I try not to think of it in specific categories. I know sometimes um, 
in terms of identifying yourself and identifying um, sort of how you think of the disease that you have, it's, it sometimes can be helpful to think of in that way. But from a dermatology perspective, we often treat them very similarly. And so I don't think of like seven different subcategories when I'm diagnosing um, someone. Are any of these different um, ways in which eczema can manifest on your body, are, are any of them harder to, to treat and diagnose than others? So I think um, one of the types that people often refer to as neurodermatitis, which in, in the dermatology world we refer to as lichen simplex chronicus, I think that one is particularly hard to treat because um, what lichen simplex chronicus is, is, is thickening of the skin that happens as a result of rubbing or scratching. So usually you have a different type of eczema and then you're itching and understandably you scratch or rub as a result and then your skin thickens up. And then within that area of thickened skin, your nerves remodel in such a way that that, that alone, that patch alone generates an itch signal. So even if you were to treat all of your eczema and it would all go away, if you had that thickened area of skin, that can be quite itchy. And it's really hard because the process of getting rid of that or curing that is softening that skin out and like making sure it sort of returns to normal. And a lot of that has to do with not scratching the area. And I never tell my patients not to scratch because I feel like that is a very sort of condescending thing to say. I think of my job as making the skin less itchy and making you not want to scratch it. But um, sometimes making the connection between why a condition exists and what we contribute to that can be helpful in figuring out how we can sort of disrupt that cycle. We had one um, community member ask uh, what the difference was between atopic dermatitis and neurodermatitis. Is it the thickening of the skin that you were just talking about? So um, the, the difference is that lichen simplex chronicus is a result of any condition that causes itching and scratching over time. So it's almost like they would happen in sequence with each other. So um, um, having atopic dermatitis that's not well controlled, which is lead, leading you to itch, rub, scratch, you can down the line get thickening of the skin there. And, and so they can coexist together. Got it. Are people with one type of eczema more prone to getting other types of eczema? Um, so in thinking about why you get eczema with the genetic and environmental factors, um, you're, if, if you have a genetic tendency, um, you can likely get several different types. So and if we're also talking about types of eczema, the different types you get can change over time. So we think of kids getting it on their cheeks, maybe in their... Um, in the folds of their body, and then as adults, maybe having it in different locations, on the eyelids, on the hands. So I do see this progression, and it's probably because of someone's underlying tendency, or perhaps because of their in environment. So I don't think that there's necessarily a causal link between one type of eczema and another, but just because you as the person have eczema, you have things about you that make it more likely to happen in you. So you may get another type of it. Are certain types of ethnicities more likely to have eczema? And if so, why? Um, that's a really great question. And it's a very, there's a very nuanced answer. And I think it's important to understand that um, race and ethnicity is in no way coded in our genetics. Race is something that was created by man. We decided that this group of people is black, this group of people is white, this group of people is Asian. So there's nothing about us internally that makes it more likely for you to get it um, in terms of your race or ethnicity. But um, what research has shown is that certain people may be more likely to have it probably because of social factors. So where someone lives and does a certain group of people tend to live in a certain type of environment, tend to have exposure to certain types of environmental triggers. 
So we know that, um, that um, Black and Latino people tend to live more concentrated in cities where there's more exposure to pollution. We also know that because of the way our, um, our real estate is set up, um, those groups of people tend to live closer to, for example, like pollution generating factories. And all of that plays into someone's likelihood of developing eczema. Whereas if that person lived in an environment where they didn't have exposure to those things, they may not ever develop it. So I think it probably has more to do where people geographically focus and what someone's individual situation is that happens to fall along racial or ethnic lines as opposed to it being related to one's race or ethnicity specifically. Got it. Great. Can you also let me know if you, I'm not explaining things in a way that you think is understandable because sometimes I say a lot of things and I just want to make sure that, <laughs> and anyone can ask for a clarification in the chat box too if. I say something yeah. that doesn't make sense. Definitely. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. um, okay, another person asks us, why does my eczema flare up in the same place every time? So um, this has a somewhat complex um, answer, but to simplify it a little bit, um, Eczema is caused by hyperactivity in your immune system. And so there are certain cells that are primed to generate that hyperactivity in the immune system, which in turn causes eczema. And we think that those particular cells called T cells come to the same spot in the skin all the time. So you probably have millions and millions and maybe billions of them around the body, but each one homes or comes to a certain area of the body over and over again. So those cells that are primed to cause eczema on your elbow are always gonna come back to your elbow. And that's why it probably happens there over and over. And then that area of skin may have more damage or may be more prone to some of the, um, some of the changes that we see in the skin that um, contribute to eczema, like mutations in certain proteins that lead to water evaporating more quickly in the area becoming more dry that may impact certain areas of your skin more than others, which make those certain areas more um, susceptible to developing the visible findings of eczema. What would you recommend that somebody do if they notice that they only flare in the same, like let's just say five part locations on their body in between flares, what would you recommend they do to kind of rebuild those, that, those particular areas of skin? So there's a couple things. Um, I like to think of the skin as a brick wall and um, the brick wall is keeping out all the irritating things that can start to trigger the cycle that contributes to itchy, dry, ex eczema skin. Um, and in eczema, that brick wall maybe has a few more cracks in it or maybe is crumbling in certain areas and needs to be rebuilt. And so, in treatment, um, making sure you're moisturizing and adding the proteins back to the skin that are needed to help reinforce that wall is really important. So um, using cream-based moisturizers, I think, are is, is better than lotions for most people with inflamed skin. First of all, people with eczema probably don't get very moisturized from lotions. I know I have patients that are like, I put it on and then 10 minutes later, my skin is dry again. Um, so heavier moisturizers tend to work better and that helps to reinforce that brick wall and build things up. Um, and there also is some research to suggest that hot spot treatment um, in between flares works well. And what's hot spot treatment? So that's when you use an anti-inflammatory um, topical agent. And even if you're not having an active flare in the spot that you know you flare frequently, maybe once or twice a week, you put a little bit of that anti-inflammatory treatment to keep those cells that I was just telling you about kind of calm in that area. And that has been shown to help um, decrease the frequency of flares. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, speaking of moisturizing, you know, we had a community member say, how can I moisturize when I feel like everything makes me flare? Yeah, so that, that is a shared experience, I think, of many people. And one thing you have to be certain of or consider is whether you have a contact dermatitis. 
and contact dermatitis is when um, something comes in contact with your skin that you are allergic to and it triggers rash, itching, stinging, all of that. And people with eczema, they, um, I see contact dermatitis all the time because the skin, which normally is keeping things out, is not working in the way that we want it to. And so little bits of lotion and pieces of like components of the lotion get into the body. And over time, the body starts to recognize that as the enemy. And so, um, you know, I think it's important to make sure that you're not flaring because you're allergic to something in that lotion or that cream. The most, the, the thing that's probably the least likely to cause that sort of reaction is um, petroleum jelly or um, Vaseline. So um, if you're looking for some alternative, that's a good place to start. But getting in touch with your dermatologist to see whether patch testing might be reasonable for you is a good idea because it could be that there's something in that lotion whether it, or that cream, whether it's a preservative, whether it's something else in there um, that is causing you to get irritated, that could be the problem. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that actually um, is a really good segue into another question a community member had, which is um, diagnosed or not, how do you know which doctor, how do you know when you go to your HCP versus your dermatologist versus maybe an allergist? to kind of get to the bottom of, of what's causing your, your eczema. Yeah, I think, and I, I think that's a personal question. Um, I think if things are very severe and, you know, you're having trouble, it's, it's impacting your day-to-day -day life when you're in a really severe flare, I think that's the time to go to a dermatologist to see, you know, what sort of tricks or things that we might have to get things under control. Um, but I think that probably varies based on where people live. So you may not live near your dermatologist and your, right. your closest by practitioner might be your um, primary care doctor. And I think if you have a good relationship with that person and you update them whenever you do have the chance to see the dermatologist, like this is, these are the treatments that I'm doing now. They told me to do this in this situation. That person then can become pretty agile at helping you through flares like that while you're waiting to get into the dermatologist or it's far enough away that you can't go today. Um, so I think that that is kind of a personal, a personal question. I think either one could be the right answer. And certainly if you go to your primary care doctor or your HCP um, and they feel like this is se severe enough to go to the dermatologist, they'll certainly direct you to the dermatologist. Um, and I think allergists come into play um, more if you're trying to think about, you know, foods that may be triggering things or all of that. Um, and allergists do different testing than dermatologists do for that um, sort of thing. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so what are the different severity levels? Um, as it pertains to eczema and what do the and what does the severity mean and how is it used to treat patients? Um, so there's a way that we score eczema based on how much of the body it's um, covering, how much redness there is, how much itching there is, how much scale there is. And so it gives us an objective way to track how it's doing over time. Um, and this is often primarily a research tool. Sometimes insurance companies require it um, documented in order to, before they'll pay for certain medications to be used. But uh, one, of, one of the ways that I find is a little bit more straightforward and more patient-centric to understand how the, severe the eczema is, is asking for an itch score and then asking patients to grade the severity of their itch on a scale. Of, of zero to 10. And that actually has been shown when tracking that over time um, to, to track very nicely with the severity of eczema. And rather than, you know, get my calculator out and calculate everything, which sometimes I do for specific purposes, I would rather ask you how you're doing and how severe your eczema is for you today. Because if you're feeling really itchy and things feel severe to you, regardless of what that calculated score says, I'm going to 
think about how we can change our treatment approach. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, sorry, just going down really quick. Um, the next question, uh, what do you wish your patients knew or would do um, in order for them to get the best results from their visits with you? That's such, I love that question because um, I think it all has to do with preparedness. And um, I encourage people to write questions down before they come to the doctor um, because sometimes it can be intimidating to be in the medical realm and having your questions written down that way you can make sure you get them answered before um, you leave. Um, I encourage people to think of their, at least when they see me, think of it as an ongoing relationship. We may not solve everything in one day. In fact, we rarely do, but um, it's just one point along the trajectory of our time that we spend together trying to figure this out and trying to help your skin improve. Um, I wish people knew that um, consistency is really important and Sometimes I think many people want to be consistent, but it can be discouraging to have a condition like this and discouraging to not notice changes day by day, even though you're working really hard to try to do everything correctly. And I wish people knew that they weren't alone in that and many people um, express that same thing. Um, but but it's, it's an important part of treatment. And I also wish more people knew about Nia. And um, I think that in a lot of the other chronic dermatologic conditions that I treat, a lot of people say, well, this support group is, you know, no offense, Dr. Lester, but this support group that I'm in has been super, super helpful, like in some ways more helpful than what I get from the doctor. And I'm not offended by that at all because I realize that I can provide a lot of things, but sometimes talking to someone who is walking in the same shoes that you're walking in is a lot more helpful than hearing from someone who has a very specific perspective. So um, I think reaching out and getting support from people and hearing what works for them and seeing how that might help or work for you is really important. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree. Um, and that's what we're here for. <laughs> um, we have a chat or a question from the chat. Mm -hmm. um, why do teeny vesicles form in dishydrotic eczema? And then the second part of that question is, do you have any tips for managing this type of eczema? Because it can be so itchy and, and get really out of control. Yeah. So um, um, answering this question sort of help, um, the best way to do it is to think, um, to think on the level of the skin. So pretend we're like shrunk down humans on top of the skin, getting a really up close look and even going inside at various points. So when I was telling you about those cells earlier that are part of the immune system that get really worked up and cause the eczema in the same spot all the time, when those cells come to the area, they bring a lot of fluid with them. They bring a lot of water from other parts of the body and they make the skin swell up like a sponge. And so when the skin swells up in that area, sometimes it sort of pokes out at very specific points and that's why you get those little bubbles filled with fluid. So that, those are the bubbles of dyshydratic eczema that occur. And, um, and it's a difficult thing to manage because it's often happening on the hands. You're using your hands all the time. So it makes it hard to like, constantly put on creams and protect them like you might your leg, which isn't exposed in the same way. Um, Especially I, now with all the hand washing due to COVID. Exactly. So I have been seeing a lot of, um, a, a lot of people who didn't even know they had this before. Cause like I was saying, you can have an underlying genetic tendency, but it doesn't come out unless you're in the right environment for it to come out. So I've had, I have grown adults who are like, I've never had this before. And now I'm doing all this hand washing and using hand sanitizer. I tell people hand, hand washing with soap and water over hand sanitizer whenever you can. If the option is hand sanitizer or your hands are dirty, then you should use hand sanitizer. But if the option is 
get up and go to the sink and wash your hands with soap and water or use hand sanitizer that happens to be right there, I would encourage you to get up and go to the sink. What, putting water on your hands, it sort of doesn't really make sense, but it actually dries your hands out more. So anytime you put water on your hands, which should only be when you're washing your hands or in the shower, you should put moisturizer on right after. That brings me to my next point, which is um, anytime you're doing dishes, anytime you're doing any cleaning around the house or anything else where you're not actually trying to get your skin clean, you should be wearing gloves. Um, and that will protect your hands. Some people find it helpful whenever, if, whether they're applying medicines or whether they're applying moisturizer to put um, cotton gloves on for a couple hours after or even overnight to help sort of make that medicine or moisturizer sink into the hands more. And I think if these basic strategies aren't really helping, you should definitely go to the doctor and see whether there could be something else like an allergy, like I was saying before, just something you're putting on your skin, which is certainly possible. So any other tips for managing itch um, besides, you know, moisturizing as often as possible? Um, I think that, so a lot of people wonder about antihistamines, are those helpful like Benadryl or Zyrtec, stuff like that. And it can be helpful, not because it's treating the itch, but it's sort of, putting you to sleep so that you're um, not sensing the itch. It's not, mm -hmm. it doesn't change the process of the itch that's happening. And sleep is really important in terms of being able to be flexible in your life and, you know, stay awake in school or at your, at your job. So I think they certainly have a role in, um, when the itching is um, keeping you up at night. Um, so it, it's not like they're not useful at all, but that's one thing that people do. Um, and I think just making sure that, that we understand why the itching is happening is really important. Cause when I hear about itch still going on, I think that there's some stone that we've left unturned and let's figure out why it's happening. Um, I also, I have my patients use Sarna lotion a lot, which can be helpful in, um, cooling the skin and soothing the area and can be helpful with itch. I usually tell people to keep their moisturizers in the refrigerator because cooling them down, once you apply it, it feels a lot more soothing. So these are some of my basic tricks. Yeah, those are really helpful. Yeah, I have my, my moisturizers in the refrigerator, especially yeah. during the summer when it's really hot. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, let's see, we have another live chat. Is there anything internally you feel helps with maintaining the skin? Lots of water, probiotics, etc. Um, so I have, I think by the time, if you're so dehydrated, meaning you haven't drank enough water to the point where your skin is dry, I think your eczema probably will be the least of your concerns at that point. So all that to say that, um, that I don't really think that excessive hydration is gonna change much on your skin. Um, I think it's good to drink water for a lot of reasons, but I don't draw the connection between those that much. I think the probiotics question is really interesting and that's an area of active research to understand what the skin microbiome, as we call it, is like and mm -hmm. what's the connection between the skin microbiome or the bacteria that live on the skin, many of which helps us, some of which harms us. What's the connection between that and the gut microbiome and what bacteria live in our stomach and our gastrointestinal tract? And so it's difficult for me to say at this point whether that actually is helpful, but I don't actively recommend that my patients take probiotics right now just because I don't have enough information that it's um, helping. Um, as long as it's not harmful, I don't recommend against it either. Great. Um, so we had a couple questions about um, eczema and genetics. Uh, for example, one woman said, my two-year-old has really bad atopic dermatitis. I am pregnant with another daughter. Is there anything that I can or should do to prevent my newborn from developing eczema? It's similar to another community member who said, um, that he was told that there was a genetic component to his eczema, although he's one of six and nobody else in his family has it. Mm -hmm. So 
could you maybe touch a little bit about um, genetics in eczema and uh, if there's any you know, factual information behind that theory? Yeah, so I'd say to address the first question first, I would say that if your baby ends up developing eczema, I don't think it's because anything you did or didn't do. Um, sometimes it's something that's just gonna, it's, it's, it's sort of gonna happen. And I, I don't like people to feel like they have blame in this situation, especially because we don't really have a good way of preventing it, like um, medication, in terms of like what we can offer as a medical community. Um, there has been some interesting research on Vaseline in kids. And so part of eczema is, eczema is part of something called the atopic march, which is eczema, allergies, and asthma. And oftentimes people have one or two of these things, or maybe have all three, and we sort of see them progress in a fashion. That's why we call it march. We, it marches along. Um, so one, one research study showed that simply smearing a kid, you know, daily with Vaseline prevented those next stages in the atopic march. So essentially prevent, prevented asthma from developing, which is a pretty big deal. And as I mentioned before, Vaseline is a great moisturizer and really doesn't have anything in the way of allergens in it. So I think that's, that's the main thing that I would recommend is smear that baby with Vaseline. Of course, yeah. you should check with your pediatrician first to make sure that there's no reason not to do that, but um, that's what I recommend. Great. Um, okay, another community member wants to know, this is from also from the chat, is there a relationship, is there any relationship between eczema flares and hormonal shifts in women? There probably is. There's no way that, I, there's no information that I have right now that I can draw it um, or, or draw a direct connection to it. I do see people with different severities of their eczema when they're pregnant. So um, when during pregnancy, there's an abundance of hormones that exist in lower amounts during when you're not pregnant. Mm -hmm. um, and there are other conditions that have sort of a, um, an immune, um, a immune system sort of genesis that behave in the same way. I don't know exactly how, what hormones may cause it to be worse or not, but I can just say from experience that I think there's something there. Yeah, I can say from experience too. My yeah. eczema was definitely much worse when I was pregnant and right yeah. after pregnancy during yeah. the, you know, breastfeeding and all that. So mm -hmm. I see a lot of women who have eczema and they have flares and, you know, like from pumping or from breastfeeding. So it's definitely a time when I see people with things worse. Yeah. Makes sense. Um, one community member is asking, I get white patches after an eczema flare. Is mm -hmm. this common? What causes them? And is there anything that can be done about the discoloration? Yeah, it would be helpful to know that age of that community member, but I will say that um, there's two different things that can happen that I can think of that might cause white patches. Um, one is, is something called post-inflammatory hypopigmentation. So after something is inflamed, you get hypopigmentation, decrease in your pigment. And that's a reaction that your skin cells that produce pigment have. And sometimes they, things get darker. Some of my patients have, um, with, with um, chronic eczema, have darker patches of skin. We just don't really know how one person will respond. It could be that those cells get upset and they leak their pigment everywhere or they just stop making it. So that's one thing that can happen and um, that does improve over time as does this other condition which is more common in kids called pityriasis alba and it's um, lighter spots on the skin that happen after more red or itchy patches um, were treated often, um, and that also resolves with time, usually around puberty. Uh, so those are two separate reasons that can cause a similar appearance, um, and I think the prognosis is good for both of them. I had to mute myself. My cat's 
Oh. Really putting on a show, screaming at me over here. Okay, so we're actually going to go to a live question. Um, Niku, am I saying your name right? Are you there? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Lovely. Um, so my question um, is, how does eczema appear differently in black or skin of color? And also, how might it be experienced differently? Color. That's a that's a really great question. I think um, it's challenging for many people to recognize some of the hallmark features of eczema in someone with darker skin, and one of them being skin redness or skin inflammation. In darker skin, it doesn't always appear red. It can look purple. It can look deep red or magenta. It can even just be brown. And so that can throw some people off um, when they're looking at eczema and may make it more challenging for them to diagnose. So that's one way. We also know that, especially in kids, um, black and brown kids, their eczema doesn't always appear in patches. They can get more bumpy looking eczema. So it's folliculocentric eczema, meaning it's, right, it's focused around the hair follicles. And that's a more common um, clinical variation, so a variation in appearance, like you're asking about, uh, that we see in, in kids with skin of color. And um, the second part of your question was, um, experience, how, how can the eczema be experienced differently? And based, there, there are many different measurement tools to understand someone's experience of their disease that have been developed by dermatologists over time. Because, you know, and this was a couple decades ago, we realized we were treating the skin, but we weren't understanding how patients were showing up given the fact that they have skin disease. And so researchers have put together one, one of the main ones that we use is called the Skindex, which um, helps people express through a series of questions um, how their disease is impacting their life. And and that's, that's how the patient reports it. And then I can come in and based on how things look, decide how severe things are. And we know that even at what the doctor might grade a lesser severity, patients of color um, are experiencing their disease in ways that would suggest that it's worse. So there's something about having the condition that we wouldn't expect them to feel as bad as they do, but they do based on these measurement tools that we have. And I don't, we haven't figured out why that is. And I think much, much more research needs to be done um, to, to really parse out why that's happening. You're on mute, Jen, by the way. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Okay. Get my cat out of here. Um, okay, uh, next question from the community uh, is, I keep hearing that kids outgrow eczema. Is there a study on this? Or is um, this true? I, I see some kids who have eczema and then they never get it again. And around puberty is the time when we see it sort of um, ease up. I see kids who have it clear through adulthood and into adulthood. Um, and, and I see, you know, adults who maybe had a very mild case to the point where they don't even remember it and have to ask their, their um, caregivers, like, did I have eczema? Um, and they're developing it in adulthood. So, um, so I think it's a little bit of a misconception that it happens all the time that people mm -hmm. outgrow it. I don't know of a study specifically. There may be one where where people have looked into this um, in terms of age. You can imagine that that would be a very long study having to follow people for like 40, 50 years. So it could be that someone is doing that and, um, and trying to get an answer. We just don't have all the data yet. But I think people feel like they didn't do something right if they don't outgrow their eczema or they don't outgrow their acne, which we're obviously not talking about today, but that's another example. But really, it's just different for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I personally didn't really have eczema when I was younger and definitely had more as an, an adult. And we certainly um, connect with plenty of people who had onset of, of 
of, uh, of eczema as an adult. And we certainly see a lot of kids who do sort of magically outgrow it. And it, and it, it, it doesn't, we don't know yet if it's necessarily going to come back or not, but exactly. yeah. Um, we have a live question from the chat. Um, it's are researchers seeking more people of color to diversify their studies? I love that question. And I think that absolutely should be the case. Um, I, I, I'm trying to think of active projects and there are so many going on UCSF, on at UCSF at any given time that there's no way that I can keep them all in my head. But, um, but I know that this is a movement in medicine. We're trying to do this more because we realize the limitations of the data we get if we have, um, a very homogenous or uniform group of patients participating in the study. So, um, I, I would say whenever you go to your doctor, ask if, you know, you know of any clinical trials or do you know of any research going on to actively seek that out, um, I think is an important thing. And, it, and it's, it's sort of luck of the draw, whether you fit the profile age-wise, um, gender, previous uh, treatments, there's all sorts of different qualifications for any given study. But I think it's important if you're interested in contributing to the medical knowledge base, which I know we all appreciate, that um, you seek those opportunities out. Yeah, and you definitely can find those opportunities on Nia's website, um, not just clinical trials, but uh, other forms of research. Um, so yeah, thank you, uh, Ashley, for that question. Um, next question we have, is they say just curious is eczema considered a first world disease and are disease rates going up or are they just being reported or treated more so um there is some like a uh, theory about exposure to germs and how it impacts your immune system when you're developing and are our super clean environments um making us more prone to asthma and um, and certain sort of allergic conditions. And I'm sure you've witnessed the way that um, peanut allergies, the recommendations around that have changed, exposure versus not early on. So I think there's definitely something there. I do also think that this is something that with organizations like NIA that are um, validating people's experience and letting them know that this is a real thing that you can have treated, more people are seeking care and so our numbers are going up for that for that reason as well. We're getting better at diagnosing things. So it's probably a combination of both, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but I definitely think that there's something about our environments being very clean that other researchers have decided help um, these allergies sort of appear later on. Yeah, interesting. Um, I have a question, you know, for a patient who's newly diagnosed um, with eczema mm -hmm. uh, and they're leaving their first doctor's appointment and they've just, you know, gotten all this information thrown at them, um, what would you say sort of like the top three things are that you hope they kind of take away as they start this journey um, with dealing with eczema? Can you think of three things that you would hope for that um, patient? Yes, there's, there's probably more than three, but I think you're right that we, that sometimes you get a deluge of information and you need, you can only hold on to a few things. But I think um, the first one to know is that things don't necessarily improve overnight. And that's what I was alluding to earlier about consistency and sticking with the treatment for a, a good period of time, which you and your doctor decide what that number is before deciding it doesn't work and stopping. Um, I think, um, I think be letting, letting your doctor know or your care team know whenever you feel like the treatments that you're given are either not adequate or you've added something else because you've, in your experience, this other thing helps with your dryness or your flaking. Just letting everyone know that what, what you're doing. I must say that I learn a lot from patients about other things that they've added on top of the regimens that I've given them because they're helpful to them. And I then share that information with other people. So it's really nice to have sort of a 
two-way communication street. And it's also helpful because if we know everything you're doing, if everything's fine, that's great. But then if something comes up and there's a change six months down the line, we can go back in our note and say, oh, remember you told me you were using tea tree oil. We know that that causes a lot of irritation or something like that. So I think knowing that, um, that sharing is very important uh, and being sort of open about that. And, um, and then I think I've alluded to this already, knowing that you're not alone. Um, I think that that is really, it's hard to feel isolated. Many people spend a lot of time trying to hide their skin and not let other people know that this is going on. And that takes a lot of energy. Um, it takes a lot of energy to move through your day like that. Uh, but I think, once you leave the doctor, hopefully you have the sense that this is obviously something they've treated before, so there must be other people that have it. And seeking out those communities, I think, is really important. All the nitty gritty about your treatments and what to use when, and I think that's important, but I think these sort of three more principle-based things are probably a more important themes that have enduring importance throughout this journey. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially as it pertains to mental health, you know, exactly. which we know is, is a huge part of, of you know, living with, with eczema. Yeah. Um, so having that community is, is so crucial. And knowing, um, also knowing when to ask for help, maybe as a asterisk to number three, because I want to stick to the rules of only picking three, but, <laughs> but knowing when to reach out and ask for help, that's part of that two-way communication because, you know, I think, the, our mind body connection is really important. And if something is unresolved, I think, you know, we don't have studies that says this exactly, but it doesn't mean that it's not happening. So knowing when to ask for help, knowing when to ask your primary care doctor for a therapy referral or something like that, there are therapists who focus on people with chronic conditions and helping them deal with those. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, does anybody else um, who's joined us live have any additional questions that they would like to ask? You can raise your hand or put it in the chat. Um, I'm glad we were able to get to everybody's questions. They've been great questions. Yeah, they have been really great questions. Um, let's see. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, then. Um, well, then I think we'll wrap it up. Um, I want to start by saying thank you so much, Dr. Lester, for joining us um, for, and for all the work that you do in our community and all the work that um, you will inevitably do in the future for our community. We're so appreciative of your time today. Um, to everyone who joined us, uh, we hope to see you again tomorrow at 11 a.m. Pacific Standard Time when community member Ashley and Laura will host a virtual meetup and support group. You can get all the information you need about that, including the Zoom link um, and all things Eczema Awareness Month at eczemaawarenessmonth.org. Uh, um, another big thank you to our sponsors and uh, the collaboration with Skin of Color Society. Um, so yeah. thank you, Nia, for everything you're doing to support patients in the space between office visits. It's really important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we're all in this together. Uh, everybody have a wonderful evening and look forward to seeing you at our next um, virtual meetup.